Stanford University. Paulo Blickstein, and Paulo is going to share with us his work on fabrication toolkits. And oh, do you mind? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they want to videotape this. All right. So welcome out. Yeah. Oh, I have finished. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, thanks everybody for being here. And um, so, so today <coughs> we're going to talk about this idea of one fabrication lab per child. And uh, I want to start talking about this idea that you've heard a lot about called the achievement gap. And um, you've probably read in magazines and newspapers about the achievement gap between blacks and whites or uh, South Korean students and American students. But have you ever heard about like the calligraphy gap? How uh, American kids are losing the edge in uh, calligraphy and therefore losing their jobs as like wedding invitation writers or something like that. Or the hunting gap, how our kids can't really hunt anymore and we're losing the edge and our country will you know, lose its kind of competitive advantage because you know, we, we won't be able to compete in the global economy. Well, w we haven't heard about those things because those things, they don't matter anymore. Um, maybe, I don't know, for some things, but not for, for most things. And, um, and the fact is, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, what we consider achievement is important. And we normally use the word achievement as a kind of a general idea, but we never really consider what we care, what, what kind of achievement we care about. So, you know, when I was in Thailand uh, uh, some time ago, and I visited this place where they have a very interesting uh, a lesson about, about achievement. And so this is a place where they, the natives, they paint pictures. So for them, you know, achievement is painting these beautiful pictures and selling those pictures for tourists. And then they actually make money. It's a kind of self-sustainable thing. But for them, you know, painting beautiful pictures is considered achievement. And uh, the only detail is that the natives that I'm talking about here are those elephants. They're not real really people. So if, we're, if you didn't know that those are elephants, you might say, oh, that's great. You know, those, these people or these beings are painting all these pictures. But actually, who is painting the pictures? Is this guy that's mysteriously moving their ears. And I don't know, it's a, you know, a century long kind of tradition that they have. I don't know how they do it. But <coughs> apparently, the way you move the ear of the elephant makes the elephant draw. But the point here is that uh, the elephants are not really doing any intelligent work. They're just moving their, uh, you know, the paintbrush. The intelligent work is being done by, by this guy. And um, a lot of what we consider achievement in schools uh, might be a little bit like this, that it's not really what we care about, but it's some other skill that we don't, but we have the impression that we, we care about. So um, there are actually two economists from... Uh, MIT and Harvard, uh, Levy and Murnan, and they say, well, let's look at the actual tasks, the actual things that people do that can be replaceable, that can be replaced by computers or, uh, or less skilled workers, and things that cannot. So they propose three kinds of tasks, for example. One is, you know, U.S. airports. So the job of dispensing airline boarding passes, you know, as we know, is being replaced by a machine. When you call a place and you say, I want you to talk to, you know, the, the, the phone asks for you for the name and they do a voice recognition and they actually connect your call automatically, that's another kind. And the third kind is, you know, two ra radiologists doing surgery using advanced vi uh, vision techniques and, and imaging techniques. And uh, so their argument is that, you know, the first two can easily be replaced by a computer, but the third cannot. And why is that? And 
reasons are first uh, the the degree to which you can represent the information uh, to a computer matters, and degree also the degree of the how you can re if you can represent the rules of what you're doing to a computer. So clearly, in the first example, the rules are you know does your is your credit card a match with the credit card on file? Is your face does it kind of looks like the face? Uh, do you actually have a ticket? You know, so very simple rules that the computer can easily understand. So it's easy to replace. The second one is also kind of easy, if, even though it's not deductive, but uh, it's also. But the third one is really hard to represent the knowledge inside a surgeon's head uh, over years and years of you know experience and and uh, doing surgery and uh, all kinds of complex things, diagnosing patients and represent in terms of. Uh, uh, information and rules that computers can understand. So if we think about jobs that are being replaced by computers or jobs that are being offshored, uh, their argument is that those two kinds, they, they are, uh, they have their, their, their days are, are counted. So, and they actually did research on this and they found out that over the past 30 years, things like complex communication and expert thinking are going up in the job market, so people are do more of those things. And things like routine cognitive tasks, routine manual tasks, they're going down because you know you have computers, you have machines to do that. So this is just to put into context uh, what I'm going to talk about of offering rich and, and deep uh, learning experiences to kids, uh, for kids, uh, in which they can use their creativity, they can develop their innovation, uh, their, their, their in, in, innovative thinking, they can uh, build things that don't exist, they can learn how to tackle complex problems. And uh, because, you know, what, what we teach in school, uh, for example, algebra, all, that's just the second part of solving a problem. The first part and the most important part is recognizing what the problem is. And then algebra is the solution for that problem. But we never teach kids to recognize what the problem is. We just say, oh, there is algebra. This is, uh, there are some equations here and there. But they don't really understand where, when and, and how they should apply those things. So uh, this talk is a lot about how to do both things, to teach the tools, but also to teach how to recognize uh, what are the problems and, and match them to solutions. So when I talk about that, I like talking about you know, this uh, little graphic here, which is instruction and construction on the x axis. So construction is when you're building something or when you're, you know, creating a movie or a robot or something like that. And the instruction is when someone is, like, telling you something, uh, lecturing you or something like that. And the other axis is customization versus standardization. So that's how I see, like, research in education and and what the, the, the kind of topology of things you can do around learning. So let's see examples of those things. For example, a lecture is the, the typical kind of a, a standardized instruction. So it's a standardized curriculum and I'm instructing you on something. A Lego booklet is an example of a cus uh, standardized construction. So you're, you're building something, but it's a, you're it's, you have all these step-by-step instructions. You're not just creating something on your own. The customized construction quadrant is uh, project-based learning. When kids are building projects and the projects are open-ended and they're doing each, each kid is do doing a different thing. And finally, for example, there are some e-learning things where you do customized instructions. So you have like a menu of different things you can choose from and then you can mix and match and all of that. Not all e-learning, but some. That's an example. So what my research group does here at Stanford is with the blue part. We, we only do customized construction research. So we are interested in the assessment, the, the technologies, the environments, and uh, all kinds of things that to make customized construction more prevalent, more present in schools. So um, there is a lot of research on uh, the benefits and the advantage of project-based learning. And this is a result from a, 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 a comprehensive review by, by Bridget Barron and Linda Darling Hammond from Stanford. So what they found looking at you know, a lot of studies on project-based learning is that 
students learn more deeply when they can apply classroom gathered knowledge to real world problems and when they, they can take part in projects that require sustained engagement and collaboration. Active learning practices have a more significant impact on student performance than any other variable, including student background and prior, prior achievement. And students are most successful when they are taught how to learn as well as what to learn. So I think this is, is good evidence that uh, project-based learning and this kind of student-directed learning is, is something very important and, we should, and that we should care about. And I just want to mention that I have nothing, if I manage to oh, come back here, that I'm not against the other three quadrants. I just don't do that research. But you know, lots of people do, and it's important stuff to do. But I'm interested in customized construction. So the open-ended projects, kids working in a project-based fashion and all of that. So this is an example of project-based learning. So this is a toilet, as you can see. And um, so this toilet is, was created by some students in Brazil uh, several years ago, about seven, eight years ago. And this toilet, um, I hope that doesn't uh, uh, you know, the, the, the regulations of the video, the things I'm, gonna, I'm about to describe are a little embarrassing, but I, I hope that it's not a problem for any of you. So the idea of the toilet was to separate the solid from the liquid. Because they, the student said the solid, not only it requires more water to be flushed, but also it shouldn't go to the same pipe, because you know, the, the liquid is more easy to clean and to like, recycle and all of that. So it's a waste to put solid and liquid all going to the same pipes. So they designed uh, this uh, toilet with two buttons, one for solid, one for liquid. So the one for liquid would, uh, you know, would less use less water and also direct the, the, the stuff to a different pipe, and the solid would you know, use more water and had a different, a different uh, system, um, a different pipe to collect it. And you know, the teacher said, well, that's a great idea, but it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. You know, who, I mean, we can't really change all the toilets in the world and use that. It's, it's a good idea, but it's not, it's not realistic at all and all of that. And then some years ago, uh, uh, after that, I went to the Sweden. And this is the Nobel Museum, actually. And I went to the bathroom, and I saw a toilet exactly like that. And this is after I flushed, so it's, it, it's not, <laughs> I don't. But, I saw a toilet exactly like that with two buttons. And then after that, this was in 2005, and I've been seeing this everywhere where I go, especially in Europe. So, and I've, I've seen many of those kinds of things happen. And it started to, you know, I started to think maybe those ideas, those crazy projects that kids do in school, they're, they're not you know, in this after school workshops, of ro robotics workshops, and all of that. Maybe they're not that crazy. This is another example. This kid, uh, also from Brazil, he built this system. He was concerned with like saving energy in street lights. So he said, you know, why are lights are on all the time? They should be off at night, uh, at, uh, during the day, of course. So he put a, a light sensor there. And then he said, well, if there are no cars on the street and no people, they should be off too. So he put a, a touch sensor uh, underneath the speed bump. So when, you, when cars go through the speed bump, they would activate the lighting, but otherwise, the lighting would be off. But then he said, well, you know, the cars are going through the speed bump and uh, the, weight, the weight of the car, you know, that, that could be used to generate some energy because, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can feel it's very heavy. So maybe we can create something underneath the speed bump that would kind of capture that energy and, and transform into electrical energy and power the lights. And, and then people say, well, that's crazy, you know, you're crazy, that's impossible. How can you do that? And if that was a good idea, someone would have done that before <laughs> and all of that. And, uh, but it was really hard to do with like the materials we had, so we, n we never did it. And then just two years ago, I saw this headline on, on, on a newspaper saying that uh, Burger King was actually doing that on the, the drive throughs They were installing energy producing speed bumps that, you know, as you go over, it, it kind of goes down a little bit and generates energy. And, and I've been seeing all these examples, and I've been thinking, well, what if you know, school would be, was a place where we could have kids do all these kinds of things for many, many years? You know, what would happen when they graduate and they go, you know, go about their lives if they had three or four patents or three or four inventions that actually work, that are actually meaningful, um, that they've already done? And so that's one part of the idea of the fabrication lab that I'm going to talk about. So 
theoretically, these ideas that I'm talking about, first they come from Seymour Papert that you might know. And what Seymour Papert said essentially was that media matters. So he initially did all of research on kids programming and invented the logo programming language and said, well, media matters. So what, what does that mean? <coughs> that means that not all media are created equal. Some media are more expressive than others. So for example, uh, acrylic paint is a great media, but you can't use acrylic paint to build a, a castle or you can use it to paint. But computers are great because they can be used for so many things. So he said it's a protein machine. You can use computers for to make a movie, to ma create a robot, a, a computer program, to create interactive art, to create all kinds of things. So some media, some technologies are more expressive than others. And he was uh, very excited with the computer because he said, well, that's a low cost technology that's so expressive that maybe it will change what's, what kids do in schools the same way that, for example, paper changed a lot what kids did in schools you know, back when, when there was no paper and everything was just oral. So this is one uh, theoretical inspiration for me, the idea that media matters, that not all media are created equal. And the second one is Paulo Freire, who is a, a, a famous Brazilian educator. And basically, what he said after doing a lot of research with fishermen in, in, in very poor regions of Brazil and adult literacy. So I think his summary, the summary of Paulo Freire is that culture and motivation matters. So what the work that he did, a uh, landmark work, was to in the 60s, people were trying to do, uh, to do a lot of adult literacy programs, and uh, a lot of them were failing because, you know, the bureaucrats in the capital were coming up with these textbooks, and then they would take the textbooks to people in remote regions in the country and say, oh, I'm going to teach you how to read and write using these textbooks, but the words in the textbook were things like car and skyscraper and things like that, and people lived in places where they, they were like fishermen, so they had like a you know, boat or like a little shack and things like that. So they couldn't really understand what, th what those words meant. The words were totally meaningless to them. And so what he said is that there's no sense in creating this standardized curricula that we're going to use everywhere. We should customize curricula and first, before we even think about the curriculum, we should get to know what the community is about what people care about in this community. And then we should build customized curricula for every place we want to work with, departing from what they care about, what they know, what they want to know. So he built this um, curriculum for the fishermen, where, uh, for like adult literacy, where the words that he used were, you know, things like fish and net and boat and all of that. And then he became famous because he was able to to teach them to read and write in five days, in 40 hours. And this was like very well documented you know, by like hundreds of people because no one believed that it was possible to teach you know, people to read and write in, in 40 hours. And then he became famous. And then, so the idea is that you know, culture matters, that uh, adapting what you want to teach to the local culture, to the local reality, it really has a huge effect on learning. And because when you adapt those things, to what matters to people, you get a huge motivation boost because all of a sudden you're not forcing them to talk about things that are totally foreign to them, but you're saying, look, this is meaningful to you. I'm teaching you something that's, that's going to make your life better because you can use this knowledge to, you know, in the case of the fishermen, they could use the knowledge to be more productive, to negotiate prices better, to read about uh, different techniques that they could use to improve their, their fishing and all of that. So. Those are the two theoretical ideas. One is that media matters, and the other is that culture and motivation matter. So let's move on to, so this is what, uh, you know, the things I'm going to talk about today. And uh, so the idea of the fabrication lab is one kind of what I call generative space. So a generative space is a, sp a physical space where you go and you work on projects, and it, it has this property of generating ideas, generating motivation, ge generating excitement. And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but the four elements that I'm going to show uh, to you today are, first, how do you do tech development for those kinds of generative spaces? So what kind of, what do, what's the role of technology? 
what's the role of collaboration and how do you study collaboration in those places? How do you bridge those spaces uh, to regular schooling and how do you assess what people do? So we'll start with tech, tech development and uh, I'll tell a brief story about the Google board and this is work I do with my friend uh, Arnon Sipitakiat from Chiang Mai University in Thailand. So the Gogo board was uh, born in this farm fi farm, uh, fish farm in Thailand. And to make the story short, uh, this was an after school program. Kids were doing robotics. And one girl built a system to turn on and off the lights. Those lights, they attract insects. So the lights um, would, you know, she would have to walk all the way to the fish farm and then back home every day. So she built a system that would automatically uh, do that with a Lego brick. I would automatically turn on the light, wait three hours, turn off uh, all of that. Oh, no. So, what happened here was that uh, after we were done with this week-long workshop, the father of the girl said, you know, okay, now it's over, just return everything to the these guys, and I don't want this in my fish farm. And we said, no, you can't keep it, you know, it's, it's fine. We, we can use this system. It was uh, actually working. And he said, no, I don't want to keep it because, you know, this will attract thieves to my fish farm and people will come and steal and break the stuff. So just, I don't want this like $300 device attached to my fish farm, so just take it back. And we got, after this, we got a lot of complaints from, I in many developing countries, people said, you know, the, we're working with the Lego bricks. People say, this, this thing is too expensive, I don't want even my kids playing with them because if they break, they, g they have to pay and you know, $300 or $400 is what people make over like two or three months. So we had a big resistance that we couldn't imagine because you know, here we say, okay, it's a $200 thing. People don't want to fight over that. But in those places, it was very, very important. So, so we said, okay, we have to develop something that's appropriate to these places. And that the answer is not uh, a Lego brick. So we developed the Google board, which is a, a, a robotics interface and a sensing interface that you can build with locally available parts. So we did research in all of those countries where we're working in Thailand and Brazil and all of that. So you can build a board with components that you can find locally so you don't need to buy from another country. Uh, users can assemble. So you know, if you know some, uh, something about electronics, you see that this is a single-sided board and the traces are very thick so it's easy to solder, it's easy to make on your own. And, uh, it's also easy to customize, so if you don't need all the functionalities, you can remove things. Everything is open source, of course. And, uh, and then we had, and I, I should mention that this is four years before you know, Arduinos existed. So we, we, we didn't have that, that option even. And then we saw people picking up this in China. So this is you know, a board that was built in China, in Portugal, and people customize and make you know, their own like, little versions of the board. This is a little factory that a school, crea a, a school created in Brazil to assemble boards, so the kids were assembling their own robotics boards. Uh, this is a, a school in Mexico where they made some crafts, as you can see in that picture. They sold the crafts to buy some, uh, some of the parts, and other parts, as you can see, they actually scavenged from broken electronics and they build their own version of the, the board. And uh, you can't see here, but underneath, it's not really a printed circuit board. They actually manually wired every single pin of the microprocessor uh, to the other components. And uh, so it was a pretty amazing kind of appropriation of, of the technology. So, and then, you know, we also did a lot of design on the programming. So on, on the left is how you'd program a blinking light using processing or like Arduino boards, and that's how you'd program it in logo. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to teach uh, like a 10 year old what digital write means or, you know, what lead pin high, but it's very easy to say, you know, and this is from Seymour Papert, this language design, say, you know, A comma on, weight 10, A comma off. You know. Well, so, you know, people do all kinds of things with the Google board. This is a Romba vacuum cleaner that, you know, some kids did. This is, a, of course, a, a hand vacuum. This is a, a page turner for a book <laughs> for the blind uh, that they did. This is, uh, well, so this is uh, uh, an, another thing that uh, on the tech development side that I want to talk about. So 
we've been doing this work with robotics for many years and uh, and I've, I've been noticing recently that you know I go to schools I start working with kids and they don't really care that much about robots as they used to I think and they they start saying I want to do something for my iPod everyone wants to do something for the iPod so this kid he wants to do like a kind of night vision thing for his iPod uh, Nano and so he's showing like how it should work you know with some uh, uh, infrared LEDs and all of that these other kids, you know, the first thing they do when they get to the workshop is they want to do an amplifier for their iPod or something to, you know, change the sound of their iPod and something like that. Then, you know, other kids, they want to do amplifiers, they want to do like speakers and it's, it's like an overwhelming uh, majority of kids that want to do stuff for their iPod. So, the other group of kids, you know, they want to do stuff with image because now everybody has a camera in their pockets and they take pictures, they want to play with the pictures, they want to do all kinds of things. So I've been thinking, you know, for the past year that there's something there. Why are all the kids interested in doing stuff with music and iPods and all of that? And how can we design to uh, cater to that interest? So instead of, you know, pushing the robotic stuff that, you know, maybe we think it's important, but they come with this, all this interest in, in, in image, in sound, in music, which is very authentic. So, departing from that, we started to, you know, a new project that, that's the Gogo DSP. So, the idea of the Gogo DSP is, and this is a fake prototype that doesn't work, that we just took a picture for this talk, but, you know, if you know that those components, they mean nothing. It's just, uh, <laughs> but th the idea is that, you know, we are using these micro tiny cameras that you can see on, that, that's a real camera on the quarter, and, and creating a version of the board that can do image and sound processing, and so digital signal processing. So kids can attach their iPods to this board and design filters or design kind of distortion patterns for the music, or take pictures, or, or you know, do some I simple image processing kinds of stuff, or do programming using images. So for example, take a picture of you and then say, follow this guy around, like, a, tell a robot to follow a person around and all of that, or follow a certain voice or a certain sound and things like that. So that's an example that I want to show of how the technology development for this kind of generative spaces that I'm talking about, it should not depart from the adults trying to push stuff onto the kids because we think stuff is important, but how we really should listen to what they're saying and uh, how we should listen to the the culture they're in, the kinds of things they're interested in. And also, it changes from country to country. So we had a lot of assumptions working in the US about what people would like. And then when we actually went to different countries, we realized that it wasn't that way. So that's the first element. So let me move to the second one, which is group collaboration. And if you have questions, do you have a question? So If kids have a mobile phone with a camera, eventually could you having could you have them programming on the mobile phone itself? And no, you don't need a circuit board anymore. To yeah, get all I the winds of the web. Yeah, I think you can definitely do that. Uh, one one problem for that, and that's one of the reasons we're, we're designing a board, is that sometimes you want to do remote data collection, so you're going to leave something overnight somewhere for like or like for a week collecting pictures to do a time lapsing or you know so this kind of thing so for, for a lot of things you you probably will be able to use your cell phone because it's you know you have the, all the hardware over there but sometimes you don't want to leave your cell phone for a week so uh, for that's one application where cell phones wouldn't be uh, good for but for a lot of things they are so the group collaboration thing and this is a uh, work I'm doing with my uh, graduate student Daniel Green so in those generative spaces, you also need to study what happens, how people collaborate. Because, you know, if collaboration doesn't really work very well, uh, it's really hard to get kids to do something uh, meaningful because, you know, uh, they are working groups all the time and all of that. So, one way we're looking at co group collaboration and trying to study it is using this thing called the GoGoBot. So, the GoGoBot is a car, it's a very simple car that where each person, it's, a, it's uh, an experiment for four people, and each person controls a different wheel. So that's how it looks like. People have four, each person has a computer, and then we give a course, like a maze kind of thing, and then we tell people, you know, navigate through this maze. And the maze is, we give several mazes, like in increasing, in, in, with increasing levels of difficulty. So first thing, for example, just go on a straight line. 
Second thing is like is a maze of one turn. Third thing is like two turns and so on. So what we are looking for here is to learn if there is a match between the difficulty of the task and the complexity of the collaboration schemes that people come up with. So the kind of findings that we have, and uh, those are grad students, Stanford grad students, by the way. But the kinds of things that we found is that when the task is simple, for example, just going on a straight line, people just go about their business. They don't really talk much. They just, you know, turn on. And I mean, well, I forgot to say that things, stuff, stuff people can do with the car is just turn the wheel on, off, or toggle the direction. You can't steer the car, right? So th to turn the car, you need two people to agree on, you know, one person turning backwards, one person turning. And if everybody is doing something different, then the car doesn't do anything, right? Oh. So anyways, so when the, when the task is simple, people don't really collaborate a lot because they understand that, you know, First, they, their role doesn't matter much because it, if three wheels are going in the right direction, even if one is off, it doesn't matter, or if one is turning the, the wrong way. <coughs> but as we make the task more and more complex, then people start to either get violent or, I mean, not really <coughs> physical violent, but they start, you know, leaders start to emerge, people start to come up with all kinds of complex strategies for making the car go. And so what we're interested in here is, you know, how, is there an optimum uh, level of difficulty for groups where we get the best from them? Because if the task is too easy, you know, people don't really care. They say, yeah, whatever, you know, anything goes. I know it's going to work anyways. If the task is too hard, people, it's too frustrating. People also disconnect. So we're trying to look at, uh, uh, you know, of course, this is a much simplified task. People are not building the robot. They're just operating something. But we're using this as a, a first study and a proxy for, you know, how, how we also have this other system called mechanics that was created by two students uh, uh, in my lab and here is kids they create machines using simple machines like levers and inclined planes and things like that so they create these systems together in pairs or in groups and they have to make a marble go from the top part to the bottom part and then they, they do all kinds of things so that's another uh, uh, way we're studying you know how people collaborate in this kinds of environments so when we gather enough data about these collaboration patterns, then we build agent-based models where we program these virtual agents to do the same thing as you know, we, we think people are doing. And then we, we run lots of batches of simulations to see if those behaviors really actually correspond to, to what we're observing. We play with the variables and we do all kinds of uh, interesting studies with that. So that's number two. So number three of those, the, those four quadrants is assessment. And uh, so assessment is important because, you know, people say well, if you can't measure it, you can improve it and all of that. But it's a really big challenge. Uh, it's easy to assess, uh, you know, basic algebra, uh, reading skills and things like that. And unfortunately, uh, education these days is biased not so much but what we think it should be, but by the instruments of measurement that the economists uh, uh, learn to love. So it's very, there are fantastic instruments for, you know, tests for assessing basic math and basic reading. And that's how the entire education system uh, uh, gets uh, structured and uh, how the funding gets decided and, and everything else. So it's not really, you know, the kinds of skills that we care about, but are the kinds of skills that we know how to measure. And, and that's a really big problem because if you want to, you know, change education and have more project-based learning, have more uh, creativity, innovation, kinds of things, uh, and you don't know how to assess things, it's really hard, especially on a large, you know, large scale, on a, like country level. So how are you going to distribute the funding? How are you going to know if people are doing well, if they're improving and all of that? But it's a big challenge to assess open-ended learning because people are learning, you know, each person is doing a different thing. So uh, the one of the things we're doing is this project called Learning Analytics and with my grad student Marcelo who is over there and uh, so we got a he got an 818 fellowship for this the, the, this project and uh, so the idea of Learning Analytics is that we don't want to uh, interfere too much in the in the process of people building stuff making stuff we want to do natural assessment so 
put lots of instruments around a person in a way that's non-intrusive and people can go about their business, but we can gather a lot of data about what they're doing. So for example, cameras, for example, biosensors, you know, skin conductivity, things like that. For example, uh, speech, so what they, how they talk about what they created and, and, and this kind of things, how they move around in the lab, how much time they spend in, with each tool and, and things like that. So for example, just a kind of a face validity kind of introduction. If you look at those five pictures, drawings, uh, though this is over three months, you can clearly see, and this is for a volcano project that some kids did, you can clearly see how it, it evolved, right? But I mean, how can you uh, standardize this kind of me uh, measure? It's, it's really hard, but that's the kinds of things we're trying to do. So you can see that in the first drawing, even before starting the construction, they were doing like a Mentos and, and a soda bottle. That was the volcano, right? <coughs> As you know, every kid loves to do. And then the second one was a bit more sophisticated. You can see there was some, you know, more fine detail. Then the third one was a pump, the four, and then finally they had like a pressure cooker and all kinds of complex things. And they actually built that. And uh, if we have time, I can show you the video. It's very cool. But so what we're doing is we're collecting hundreds of drawings like this. This is a drawing for a thermostat machine, right? So a fan, a heater, and a thermostat. And we're trying to create a topology and a, a classification scheme to understand those drawings. So the first one is, was done by a nine-year-old. And the second one was done by a high school s student in a low uh, SES uh, school. So you can see that the nine-year-old and, and the, the low-achieving student, they have pretty similar kinds of uh, drawings, regardless of their difference in age and education. And this is a, a, like an undergrad, a Stanford undergrad. You can see clearly that went through the, the amazing courses in computer science. Yeah, <laughs> we had to. Anyway, so the, the approach that we're taking is to you know, have a, a, a huge database of drawings and uh, classifying them in terms of uh, detail, in terms of labeling, uh, 2D versus 3D, all kinds of things. And also doing some machine learning, so you know, doing, running some classification things so that we can do this comparison across age groups, but also if you start a robotics workshop and then a week later you, you do another drawing, we want to see if those two drawings uh, compared to the, the, our database of hundreds of drawings uh, that were, were scored by you know, independent people and all of that, how do you, sc how do you uh, rate in, in that, in that uh, scheme? What were the conditions under which people produced it? You just ask people, produce a drawing that represents how this system works? Yeah, th this was a, a kind of think aloud interview. So they were, I mean, we have the, the you know, the it speech and all. It seems hard to know whether the students at the top knew about some control structure and didn't get around, you know, didn't feel like it was worth drawing right, versus, right. and so do you think, I mean, it, it seems like behavior, some kind of more behavioral measure would be a, a stronger sense of what do they understand, you know, can you get them to build a thermostat? Right, yeah, no, that, that's an interesting idea. I mean, this is, we also capture, it's a, we have the whole video thing and we transcribe and then we try to match stuff, uh, uh, measures from the transcription to the drawings as well. So we don't take the drawings in isolation, but I agree with uh, your, uh, what, what you're saying because, uh, you know, the prompting might, might matter in this case. But I think it's a good idea to do, to ask them to, you know, build. Uh, and and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, uh, the, the other picture I showed, the mechanic system, where you have actually the parts that are very easy to move. So that's one of the uh, things we use for this kind of thing, because we, we can actually track, using a vision system, how people are moving those things. So that would be an interesting thing to, to look at that. So, um, So let me show you one example of how we uh, kinds of interesting findings from looking at the way people draw. And hopefully it's going to open. So this is two people, uh, mouse, mouse. Oh. 
So this is a, a, a mechanical engineering PhD and a, a, a literature major uh, drawing a trash separation machine. Okay. So just uh, it's a 30 second video. So we, we build a system, a vision system, to actually capture this from underneath. Anyways. So just look how the guy, the mechanical engineering there, is first building a table of all the materials in the trash and the properties, and the other person is just drawing the things uh, without thinking about properties, right? And so, you know, when, when they stop, I'll, I'll talk about some features of those two drawings. So I think the, the fascinating thing about those two drawings is that the actual solution that they, they have for the problem is the same. So the solution is that they will put paper and plastic in a water tank and the paper and plastic will float and the, the metal and the glass will sink and that will be one of the you know, big separation uh, stages. And which is the same as the guy draw you know, paper, plastic and a water tank and all of that. So it's a mechanical engineering PhD and a non-technical person. They came up with the same idea, but the way they explain, as I was showing in another slide, the way they explain the idea is radically different. And the way they represent the idea is also different. The way they, they came up with, with, with this drawing, so the, the mechanical engineering guy first created this table of no metal, paper, plastic, and the properties and all of that. And this person actually drew paper plastic and, and some people there. And you can see it's out of scale and all of that. So those are the, some kinds of measures that we're looking at in terms of uh, you know, how, to, how people draw, how people represent, how they talk about what they're drawing, and, and their expertise in, in, in drawing. In so would you score the left worst because it has people in it? Um, yeah, we would score that worse in, in that sense because uh, the people are not doing anything there. It's just a pictorial representation of how she thinks this place is operating. But we explicitly said that, that the, 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 the there was no human, uh, um, I mean, people couldn't actually touch the trash, right? It, this should be a fully automated thing. So they knew that people wouldn't matter there. So we would score, uh, you know, putting people there, since we know that they have no function as a... Did the people in there control function? <coughs> <coughs> I mean, did they explain it there? Yeah, well, in, this, in this case, no, but that, that, that could be a, a possibility. That people say, I'll put people to oversee the process. they want to put controlling there. Right, yeah, that's a good idea, too. Yeah, that they were that naive to think they're not part of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's a good idea. But, uh, I mean, this... Were this you surprised by these results? Yeah, I, I was actually surprised. Me and uh, if let me just show the actual transcripts. What country was that? Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So let me sh j just talk about tra transcripts. Uh, so this is for the the for first person. You know, I don't know. I don't know anything about properties of things. I'm a humanities major. I don't think that's right. But maybe they lose weight because that would be different with density. I guess. But also, if you're really going to be crazy, sink it to a pool of water and paper would float, and empty bottles would float, and you only have to divide two. And then th the engineer said, well, my first reaction is, okay, I need to separate those materials. I'm going to leverage the power of water, because I assume that in water, paper will float uh, uh, for a little bit, uh, paper, paper will float, plastic will float, and metal will sink. So it's basically the same idea. I think was, what was surprising, I mean, as you say that, said, you know, if you're going to be crazy, sink into a pool of water and paper would float and all of that. And that was like, you know, the mechanical engineering guy was saying, oh, well, let's, uh, you know, put it in a tank of water and or. So I think a lot about, I mean, one of the interesting things about this is that a lot of solutions that we hear from kids, and th these are uh, undergrads and grad students, but that we hear from kids, they sound uh, weird or crazy. And I show, you know, the, the, those things that became products and all of that. But sometimes it could be that the way they talk about or they represent is not the best way, but the actual core of the idea is good, right? And we're not training teachers, for example, to recognize those cores of ideas that are good. 
So um, what my student Marcelo is doing is, you know, trans looking at the transcripts and using uh, machine learning to look at, you know, differences and if we can set apart novices and experts based just on the, you know, tokens and, and all kinds of, you know, text analysis and text mining uh, uh, techniques, and then look at the drawings and see if we see the same kind of correlation. But, but in this case, they came up with the same solution, so wouldn't you want to have a scoring system that scores both of them as being successful? Yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. So this would be two successful solutions. So, um, okay, so the, the other thing that we're looking at in terms of uh, this learning analytic analytics is how people program. So, we look at snapshots of programming programs that people do, and we have all kinds of measures to see how that process is happening. So, let me show you one example <coughs> again. So this is a demo of a tool that we created where we can uh, collect every second uh, you know, what people are doing in a, when they are programming, Java or all kinds of languages. So, so now I'm loading the log. So this is a log that contains, for example, a whole day of programming, people writing programs. And then I have this tool that where I can just click on the different events, the different times people hit compile. Every time they hit compile, I get a snapshot. So, and then I can look at like a movie editor, like frame by frame, what, what people are doing. And then I can plot things, uh, you know, for example, the character count or the frequency of certain words and all kinds of things. And, and this, this tool actually allows you to collect on the fly. So if you're a teacher sitting in front of the room, you can actually, uh, you know, people are programming on their stations and as they compile, you can see what they're doing in a graphical format. So for example, now we're saying, you know, as you see, so you, set, you compile and then the tool is collecting all this data. So we are using this to look at, for example, the diversity of vocabulary that people use, the kinds of uh, mental models that people use to program, the kind of control structures that they use, and how it changes over time. And we collected, uh, a lot of data from people creating sci um, uh, scientific models in you know, kind of MATLAB kind of programs and things like that. One of the interesting findings is that undergrad students, they work more at between 3 and 5 a.m. because we have the timestamps of the thing. <laughs> but, uh, so, so that's a good tool to spy on students. Too. But anyway, so that's the... Yeah, so that's an example of the, the, we call the event navigation. Anyway, so, uh, and we're, we're looking at other things to, to do uh, in, in, that, in that direction. So, uh, you know, and analyze things together with the drawings, uh, using prosodic and spectral features, so the, the amount of time people pause, or the kind of, you know, they say, uh, oh, this is like, and then they stop, I mean, all, all these kinds of things we're looking in, in you know, a part of speech, and we're looking at building uh, uh, language models for each of those tasks that we give them and all of that. So this is the direction of learning analytics. So it's how you, how to assess open-ended tasks. So writing a program or building a machine or doing all kinds of things where each person is doing a different, a different task and you don't, it's not predicted by a, it, it's, it, it, you, you cannot predict w the outcome of every single project. So we're looking at the process instead of the, the end uh, result. So, yes? So you mentioned the event navigator as uh, providing sort of a, an assessment of groups' activities. That's what I take it as, uh, so in real time. Uh, is, there any, and is there any way that that could perhaps be used to, to aid collaboration? That it is group activity, perhaps towards a goal, and then rather than, than having a, an, an external assessment, uh, provide that information to the group itself. Yeah, that's and, uh, uh, kind of as formative. As perhaps a, a neutral intermediary. Right. That, um, that's that's a great idea. Uh, I think there are lots of 
So kind of a monitoring tool that people could use to see how they're doing as they're doing the tasks, like what the are groups. What are the connections between assessment and collaboration? Again, sort of a little more level playing field. Right. No, I think that's, uh, that's a very good idea to use the, those kinds of tools to provide feedback to students as they are doing the task. That's, I guess that's what you used to do, yes. I think that's a very, that's a very good idea. And we haven't done that, but I think it's, it's a good direction. So I think this is the last part of um, those four quadrants, and I want to go through this uh, quickly, but I think this is a, a, an important one. And so this is about building bridges of schools. So we have these places, these after-school programs of robotics or uh, lots of different after-school programs, but they are not very well connected to schools, to the regular school day. And so this project that's called by Focal Modeling <coughs> is about this connection. So can you connect after school and during school? So the idea of by Focal Modeling is that when you're investigating a scientific phenomenon, you normally build a model of this phenomenon. Uh, you know, you, you hyper hypothesize an equation that will explain the phenomenon or you build a model on a computer. So the idea is that we put that kind of stuff, so building this theoretical models with building, with sensing apparatus and then you, you look at them side by side. So the idea is, for example, let's say you build a model of the gas laws, a theoretical model, but you want to verify if your model is true. So the way we do this in this bifocal modeling activities is that we tell kids to build their own lab with sensors and all of that and then they get connected to a special interface in real time so they can run their models and, and get the data that's coming from the sensors in real time and then refine their own, their, their own model in, a, as they go. So people have done models of, for example, the gas laws. This is a model of heat transfer. So in the top, so th this student built a system with, uh, it's a wire with temperature sensors and then he's getting information and then the information is going to those eight little dots and then the, his model, his hypothesized model is on the top and then he's comparing what's happening in the real world and in his model on the fly and then he goes back and he stops and he, you know, re uh, changes his own model instead of a linear law, maybe it's a quadratic law or exponential law or something like that and then he goes back and he runs it again and all of that. And there are a lot other things like, you know, a pH model, so you have a pH reaction, a virtual pH reaction and a real pH reaction, and then you have the plot of the real and the virtual, and then you look at them in real time too. To so this is, you know, a drop counter. When, you, when a drop of base falls, then, a, you know, 50 molecules are added to the virtual simulation, for example. So you can also do that with biology kind of things, so you can, you know, tape ants going around and then, you know, do a kind of a heat map of how ants move around and then hypothesize how they move and why and, and where. So they can do some kind of threshold filtering to see where they go and all of that and then, you know, discuss those ideas with the kids. And sometimes, you know, people do other kinds of models. For example, this was a model of cooling a dorm that some kids did. So they collected data about uh, humidity and temperature and all of that and you know they did all kinds of plots and then they realized, I mean if, just to make the story short, after doing this model they realized that the dorm was really <coughs> really hot because the fans were all pointing to each other and then they built the system where the, pan the fans were pointing in this way so you know the temperature was much lower with no change in, in the system just by changing how they were you know uh, uh, how they were placing the fans and they put these buckets of water to increase the, the, the humidity and, 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 and all of that. But anyways, the idea of by, by focal modeling is that let's say you go to science class and you learn about acid-based reactions, right? And then the teacher starts a project about building a little computer model of science-based rea of acid-based reactions. Then, you know, that hour is over and in the afternoon you go to your robotics class and then the teacher said, okay, so you did this little exercise, this little activity in the morning with your science teacher. Now <coughs> let's start to build our physical model of, uh, of acid-based reactions. 
And then you build a model, and then you go back next day to the science class. Say, yeah, I built this model. Now I, I want to run it with my theoretical model. So that's why I was talking about the connections between school and after school. So the idea of bifocal modeling is that all the excitement that we see when kids build stuff, we can capture all that excitement by proposing projects that are scientific projects and that connect to theory, but are still building projects. They're still building physical things. They are building sensors. They are building their own science lab. So that's one kind of activity that we do in these fabrication la labs. And, and there are many others, but it's one kind that helps this connection between uh, uh, after school and school. So, so now, you know, everything kind of comes together in this idea of the school fab lab project. And as you probably know, uh, in a fab lab, you know, you have things like laser cutters or textiles, electronic textiles, uh, scanning and uh, 3D scanning, 3D milling machines, 3D printers, you know, all that, uh, vinyl cutters, that, that kind of stuff. So what kids do in those places, they, you know, love to do keychains, they love to do these things as they fir their first project. But then, you know, of course, they do stu giant stuff, especially after the giants won the championship. They do all kinds of interesting uh, art projects, and uh, they do sometimes more complex projects like energy-saving devices and energy-logging devices. You know, this is some uh, logging of energy that they did in, in one of place. And uh, let me just skip that. So I'm going to go back to the projects that kids do. But let me just talk about one additional benefit of this. And, and this is a bit of a surprise, which is for teachers and educators and researchers in education. We started to bring research in, in education to the lab. And what they told us was, you know, I had this dream of building this teaching device for 20 years, for teaching math, for teaching fractions and this. And I could never make it because I didn't have the, the, the right tools. And so we're getting a lot of people that come to the lab, uh, grad students in education, for example, that say, oh, yeah, I had this dream of building, for, for example, this is a place-based math uh, system for like five-year-olds. So th those two students build you know, this system in, in, in as a master's project. And this is a logic game that other students build also in, in my class. And this is mechanics that was also a project in my class. Now it's a research project. And uh, so you can see how you use all the tools. This is another project that's a uh, wind tunnel for paper airplanes. That there was this student that she really wanted to, you know, she loved aerodynamics and she never found a way to teach aerodynamics to kids in an intuitive way. To say, so she said, I'm going to build a, a, a wind tunnel and then they can use their own paper airplanes. And she has like lots of different pressure sensors that can sense, you know, lift and drag and all of that. So this is also another project that's an electronics construction kit that students did called Light Up with magnets. And uh, it's a very, very interesting and easy to use uh, project. So this is all projects done. Those are all projects done by grad students or teachers or educators that come to the lab. Uh, of course, there are projects done by kids, too. So this is a, uh, two kids that build a, a stroller that starts moving automatically when, when the baby cries. And uh, this was you know, something done by, by some kids in, in Brazil. And maybe. So this is a stroller. It moves by itself. And when the baby, there is a sound sensor that captures the, you know, the cry, the, the crying, and the, so they're presenting the project in a like big, you know, open house kind of thing. It, yeah, it, it's not a real baby there. It's <laughs> um, anyway, so so I want to uh, now move on since. I think we, we're going to move to questions in a little bit. But just to move on to, um, so the first of those school fabrication labs, so this is the first we're doing in a school in St. Petersburg in, in Russia. And uh, so this is a, a high school in Russia, and we got funding to build this lab. And for now, it's, you know, the equipment and all of that is, is 
approximately 100k, but soon this will be something like, you know, 20k. As you know, you, you, you probably know about all these open source 3D printers. There is like open source laser cutters that are being designed and all of that. So, you know, there's no way around the technology becoming very, very cheap. Uh, so this will be at some point as cheap as a computer lab. But you know, the, the tragedy of computer labs is that, you know, we put computer labs in every school and we didn't know what to do with them. So they became this kind of dead places where someone had a key and kids could use them one hour a week and no revolution really happened with the computer lab. So uh, I think our research, in, in my research group, we're trying to make sure that when we create these labs, we actually know what to do and how to organize them. And so one of simple things thing that we do is that in the contract with the school, we specify that the lab has to be open the, the entire day. And there has to be a, a lab manager that will run workshops and do all kinds of things. But also, you know, all the things that I talked before, those activities, assessments, and, and group collaboration, all those things, they are designed into this space. Um, I want to also mention some kind of additional benefits that we've been finding. So this is a, a, our, our own uh, you know, learning fab lab here at Stanford. And this is the math teacher of the East Palo Alto Academy High School. And it's really you know, not, that com not that common to see the math teacher and a student working together in a project. right? And, and this is very common in the lab. It's not also common to see a math teacher kind of crawling on the floor because he was like, he's doing a project, his own project on like trigonometry and all of that. So it creates all kinds of interesting dynamics that uh, you, you don't get in, in real school. So, you know, Roberto, can, can you help me? Oh, okay, why, yeah, why didn't my thing print? You know? so I, I said, oh, none of it's hairline, you know? So he was able to demonstrate you know, his expertise. You know, he, he's told me two or three times, yeah, I've really got this device down. You know, there was a lot of pride there. And it was real. I mean, he, he helped me solve my problem. Yeah. Because I told the um, guy that I, I, I kind of helped him out because he's, he's the one that came up to me he's like, can you help me? The teacher? Yeah. He's all like, can you help me with my um, cut, um, my angles so I could, I could cut them out and I did them for him. So how did it feel to help the teacher? Um, good because I thought I was, you know, thought I knew about my uh, the laser cutting thing. So I, I, I felt, it felt good. So he's talking about how it felt good to help the teacher, right? And, uh, and, and the teacher, how it felt good to be helped by the student, which is you know, something that's not that, that common. And this is one, one aspect of the dynamics that I wanted to mention. The second one is that a lot of times kids come, they come with interests to, to the lab. So this kid wanted to build a remote controlled car and you know I said why don't you you know maybe build a robot or do something different no I want to build a gas operated a uh, gas remote controlled car and I don't care you know that's what I want to do and all of that and then over time over the course of a day you know we talked to this student a lot of times and then we said why don't you start to do some experiments on you know the number of batteries that you put there and how fast the motor runs or maybe you can add a lot of motors and keep the same batteries and all of that. So we use deep interest and deep engagement in one topic and we try to find uh, more content related activities that kids could engage in but we also depart, we always depart from what they care about. And you know people say well but uh, what if they are interested in something crazy like box for example. So we had a kid that was interested in box actually last week and and then he actually came up with the idea of building a system because he said in box it's very important to know what's your stronger arm. So he wanted to build a system with pressure force sensors that he could punch and measure the speed of his punch and the force to know if you know which of his arms was the fastest and the strongest because it was important in a fight to know what's your fastest arm, what's your strongest arm and all of that. So that's just to make the point that Everything that, you know, every topic, everything that kids like, there's always a way to find, you know, some way to connect that to math, to physics, and all of that. And that's a kind of the professional training that we provide in the lab for teachers that we train 
to understand and recognize those passions that kids have and say and learn because it's not something that you naturally learn but learn how to connect that with math and science without you know uh, kind of make making them uh, change their topic or anything like that so I just want to you know recap that so that you keep in mind that uh, that that scheme and I want to before we move to questions, just play a, a, a quick video of um, you know that same teacher that you saw talking about his experience. In you know, gave me this idea for 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 math uh, a math classes as the design studio, and that was before this had started up. And then I came to this and saw what a real design studio feels like, and it really resonated with with my with me about. Um, that, that that's what I want for my math class, that I would like the kids, you know, trying stuff out and having an idea, having a mathematical idea and trying to put it together and, and uh, you know, working with their peers and that collaboration on, on problems that are really of real interest to them. Now, now there's a big difference between math and the, the you know, the physicality of manufacturing, uh, you know, so, uh, something that could be a toy, it could be jewelries, that often has a lot more intrinsic, you know, personal significance. Um, but that that, that creative kind of worrying, you know, uh, is, is something that I want. So a lot of the projects that kids um, engage in actually have a lot of math sort of worked in, you know, that, that they, have, they have to measure stuff, they have to lay it out on the laser cutter, you know, that they, they have to take all these numbers and, and you know, size them and, and understand what they are. But because uh, in this context, it, you know, it, that, that's a very nat the interpretation, the meaning component of the math is very natural. Whereas often in my math class, it's kind of artificial, I'm telling them. So this is the teacher, and then I just want to show the student. Uh, um, I'm yeah. using the 3D printer, and I'm making an so elephant, because that's my favorite animal. And I have a robot. This is Shakira, okay. and uh, she's talking about... A little board you know, she to make about it what work she and did what and to all do. That. A program for, like, the robot. But I want to just show you this last and part. And last week, we looked at the laser cutter and we made um, little like I made keychains I still have them right here I made keychains so would you just pay attention to the last this. part when I ask her what and she I likes more, more in school and all that here. Which is this week I made an elephant in the 3D printer and I looked at the robot and yeah that's it <laughs> Because we're not using numbers here, so I wouldn't say it's math. It kind of feels scientific, but this isn't the kind of science I do So at school, so this is fun. But like biology and um, chemistry, not fun, but this is fun. So yeah, this is different. I think this is science though, probably, right? Do you think, do you think it's science? Probably. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. Not like earthy science. Because you have to do a lot to probably create like robots and stuff, and that probably is like. So how is science that you can do different from this kind of science? Like at school, we learn about like body health and organs and things like that. And here, we learn about how to create stuff using science. So it's a little different. It's funner, and we can make whatever we want. So that's cool too. I mean, it probably would be a, like easier if we told us what to do, but I don't want that. I want to make whatever I think of, I guess. Why? Because then it, it's more personal and it's funner. If I thought of it and then I created it, then I'd probably take it more seriously because it was my idea. Okay, thank you. learning occur in like after school outreach programs so other than like cost and um, assessment what are other challenges why do you think we haven't gotten to the point where these things are required in 
curriculum? Well, I think one, one reason is that uh, after school programs are very low stakes. So uh, for the kids and, and for society in general. So if you don't make them uh, you know, rigorous and high stakes, uh, people don't, don't care that much. So for example, if you'd have uh, in the university you know, entrance requirements, uh, things that will require uh, people to think about problem solving kinds of things and all of that, then people will start paying more attention to those, those kinds of things. And the other thing is that, and I think the key thing is that the connection between those programs and regular schooling is very weak. So if there's no connection and all we care about assessing is what they learn in school, and you know math and, 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 and reading and all of that, it's natural that the whole system and teachers and all of that will focus on those kinds of things. So you know, if we don't give real incentives for students and parents and all of that to invest in those kinds of skills, uh, they will always be an after talk. They will always be some kind of add-on when you have time and all of that. And, and unfortunately, that's what's what happens. All right. I'll be around if you want to ask more questions. Thank you. OK. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.